In typical Blue Origin fashion, we are getting tiny bits and pieces from the company right now in regards to things that are going to be happening very, very soon. Unlike all of their competitors, Blue Origin keeps all of this stuff a strictly guarded secret, revealing only the container that part of their unmanned Blue Moon lander is being held in with the ultimate objective of setting this thing down on the surface of the moon by October of this year. That's right, we're talking a mere 90 days. But as we approach this critical launch date, it's starting to become clear that Blue Origin has ambitions of becoming the new replacement for Lunar Starship, the vehicle that will actually take the first astronauts to the surface of the moon this decade rather than Lunar Starship, given all of the problems that the SpaceX flagship is having right now up to the point to where the mock-up version of the human-rated Blue Moon Lander is already being worked with in a lunar gravity simulator tank with Artemis astronauts. Up to this point, that hasn't happened with Lunar Starship. Could it be that Blue Origin is going to leapfrog Lunar Starship and become the actual vehicle that takes humans back to the surface of the moon? Well, maybe. But if that is indeed the case, this vehicle is facing some very serious hurdles that are every bit as formidable as the hurdles that Lunar Starship currently faces. And unless Blue Origin does something to adjust to the new requirements of getting humans to the moon soon, I can't imagine that they're going to be any more successful than SpaceX has been up to this point. Now, there's little doubt in my mind that a lot of my viewers are going to treat the concept of Blue Origin landing on the surface of the moon anytime soon with a degree of skepticism. But what a lot of viewers may not realize is that Blue Origin technology is on the surface of the moon right now. For example, what you're watching at the moment is a device called the Planet Vac, a low cost, high reliability sample system designed to increase the science return from missions to other worlds, in this case the moon, and it was carried there by the Firefly Lunar Lander. Built by space technology company Honeybee Robotics, which is a division of Blue Origin, Planet Vac fires a blast of gas into the surface, stirring sample material, regolith, etc., into a collection container for onboard analysis or return to Earth. In its simplest form, Planet Vac has just one moving part, the valve that opens to release the gas and can be attached directly to a spacecraft's lander leg, meaning that it's ready to go as soon as the spacecraft touches down. In addition to that, Blue Origin also put a device called the Lister on the Firefly lander. Lister stands for Lunar Instrumentation for Subsurface Thermal Exploration with Rapidity. That's a bit of a mouthful, but it's a sophisticated pneumatic drill that penetrates to a depth of three meters into the dusty lunar regolith. Every half meter it descends, the drilling system pauses and extends a custom-built thermal probe into the lunar regolith. Lister measures two different aspects of heat flow through the lunar surface, thermal gradient or changes of temperature at various depths, and thermal conductivity or the subsurface material's ability to let heat pass through it. Quote, by making similar measurements at multiple locations on the lunar surface, we can reconstruct the thermal evolution of the moon. According to Dr. Seichi Nakahara, principal investigator for the mission and a geophysics professor at Texas Tech. So the point is, even though it was Firefly that actually landed on the lunar surface, this gives Blue Origin a practical experience with lunar operations, and that increases their chances of successfully landing on the moon in October. And by the way, as you can see, the Mark 1 Blue Moon Lander is actually the biggest spacecraft 
that has ever landed on the lunar surface. Assuming, of course, that it does successfully land, but even if it doesn't, it will be the largest spacecraft to ever attempt to land on the lunar surface. So a big milestone regardless. Now, NASA has a payload on this thing, a suite of cameras that's designed to record how the blast from the Blue Moon's engines disturbs the regolith at the lunar landing site. The data from that experiment, known as stereo cameras for lunar plume surface studies, or scalps, would be factored into preparations for crewed landings. And that is very, very critical for this particular lander because it's using exactly the same engines on the Mark 1 that it will use for the human-rated Mark 2. Similar payloads flew on Intuitive Machine's Odysseus lander, which conducted a partially successful mission on the moon in 2024, and a completely unsuccessful landing on the moon this year, and unfortunately, because these landings were less than perfect, the data that NASA got back was also less than perfect. And as I mentioned before, even the Mark 1 version of Blue Moon is an enormous lunar lander, substantially bigger than Apollo and capable of putting at least three metric tons of cargo on the surface of the moon. That's enough to put habitation units, very large rovers, all kinds of things, depending, of course, on what Artemis's needs are going to be in the near future. All that being said, though, there are problems with this concept as well. Problems that have already been experienced with previous landers that have tried to use this design, and I think all of you can probably guess what I'm thinking at the moment. Just look at how this thing is set up. Look at the landing gear compared to the landing gear for the Apollo LEM. Just a huge, huge difference. This thing is tall, it is top heavy, and its landing gear is narrow compared to the Apollo LEM. That's going to make it very, very difficult to put this thing on the lunar surface, especially given the fact that its first landing is going to be taking place at the lunar south pole, where the terrain is notoriously difficult. And although the human-rated version has a slightly wider landing gear, it's also substantially taller, so it has about as many problems as the Mark 1 does as far as its landing gear configuration is concerned. I'm really not sure why so many companies continue to go with this route as opposed to coming up with some kind of collapse collapsible landing gear configuration that could make for a wider span on the bottom of the lander. All that being the case though, there are other problems with this system as well. For example, a cis lunar transporter is needed to refuel the human rated lander before it's going to be able to set down on the moon. Not only that, the cis lunar transporter also has to be refueled, as you can see in the diagram. You have a new Glenn launching the cis lunar transporter, which by the way, all we've seen is CGI images of that so far. A second new Glenn refuels the cis lunar transporter, topping up its fuel, that is, and then the transporter makes its way out to near rectilinear halo orbit, where it meets up with the human rated blue moon lunar lander and refuels it at that point. So we're talking three launches of New Glenn just to get the lander out to lunar orbit. And then the SLS launches the Orion, which of course carries four astronauts out to the lunar gateway where the lander is waiting for them. The lander then takes the astronauts down to the surface of the moon, stays there for 30 days or so, and then returns them safely to the gateway. The crew then transfers from the lander to the gateway, from gateway back to Orion. Is this getting complicated enough for you yet? And then Orion brings the astronauts safely back to Earth. Now, in the future, the same Blue Moon lander can stay docked to the gateway as long as the cis lunar transporter can keep bringing it fuel and land astronauts indefinitely on the surface of the moon. So it does have a good reusability advantage. All that being said, though, we're talking several launches of enormous rockets 
just to put a couple of astronauts on the surface of the moon. It's not as bad as Lunar Starship, which requires 11 or 12 launches of gigantic rockets, but nevertheless, it adds a lot of complexity. And I have very little confidence that Blue Origin and NASA are going to be able to master everything necessary to make all of this happen before 2030, and it may even take longer than that. So does that mean there's no hope whatsoever? China is absolutely going to beat the West back to the surface of the moon? Well, it all depends. There is a way, as I've discussed in previous episodes, that we might be able to get all of this done through an unholy alliance of three different competitors. Number one, you can have Starship, not Lunar Starship, not a manned starship, nothing like that, just a starship capable of carrying 100 metric tons up to orbit. Let's hope that Starship can eventually get to that point. If you can, you can carry a very ambitious stack that's capable of reaching the moon in one launch. This stack has two components. Component one, a fully fueled blue moon lander, and component two, a ULA Centaur 5 upper stage. The Centaur 5 can also be fully fueled. The two components combined, Centaur 5 plus Blue Moon, come up to 100 metric tons and can fit inside Starship's fairing. Once these components are in orbit, having used no fuel whatsoever to achieve orbit, the Centaur 5 upper stage has enough fuel and enough thrust to get Blue Moon all the way out to the Lunar Gateway. Everything will be expendable here. You won't be able to get the Centaur 5 back. You won't be able to get Starship back. You won't be able to get anything back. However, it can get the job done in a single launch with no cis lunar transporter required. Essentially what's going on is the Centaur 5 upper stage is taking the place of the cis lunar transporter. And there's no fundamental reason why this can't be done. Aside from the fact that you have three arch rivals, ULA, SpaceX, and Blue Origin, and most importantly, Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos collaborating to make all of this happen. However, if this collaboration can be arranged, and if we get started on this right now, because it's going to take a lot of engineering to make all of this stuff work, I think it's conceivable that we could have a lunar landing by 2028 or so, because a lot of the delay in getting Blue Moon out to the lunar surface is the development time of the Cis Lunar Transporter. Blue Origin has been working for a very long time on Blue Moon, not quite so long on the Cis Lunar Transporter. If it doesn't need the transporter to get out to the moon, I think it's very possible that Blue Origin might have their lander ready by 2028 or so, whereas I think it's very unlikely that SpaceX is going to be able to get Starship from where it is now to a vehicle capable of putting human beings on the surface of the moon by 2028. To me, that doesn't seem very likely at all. So here we are, happy moon day, and for the first time, I can really see the possibility of humans returning to the surface of the moon in the next few years after being absent for over half a century after 56 years have elapsed since Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin became the first men to walk on the moon and after all of these insane budget cuts and staff cutbacks that NASA employees are protesting at this very moment as I'm recording this I think there's a real possibility that we could be returning Turning to the moon soon. That is to say, if we don't give up on it, and if we use every bit of innovation that our engineers and our workers at NASA have at their disposal, not only there, but also at Blue Origin, ULA, SpaceX, everywhere, it's going to take all of their combined efforts to get Americans on the surface of the moon before China. And if we fail to do that, 
it's going to sabotage the legacy of everything that Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, and the men who came after them accomplished back in the 1960s and 70s. Thank you very much for watching. Please don't forget to like and subscribe. Also, please keep in mind that we are currently celebrating 200,000 subscribers on this channel. We have some special merchandise to commemorate that. If you're interested, all the details are in the description. If you'd like to help the channel in some other way, please consider supporting us on Patreon. So until next time, I urge all of you to stay angry about space.